Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Chizet, and I am the adjunct curator of engagement at the Phi Foundation for Contemporary Art. I'd like to thank you for being here with us, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, Dissections uh, Stan Douglas. First of all, I would like to begin this event by acknowledging that the Phi Foundation is situated in unceded Indigenous territory. This territory is known as Jojage to the Ganyangahaga Nation, as Munyang to the Anishinaabe, and as Montreal in French and in English. It has been a historical meeting place for many First Nations, and it continues to be a space of gathering and exchange for many Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities today. We thank those communities, past, present, and future, for the care and attention given to this territory, and we hope that tonight's event honors that spirit of care and dialogue. L'événement de ce soir se déroulera en anglais. Vous êtes encouragé à envoyer des questions dans les deux langues euh, via la fonction Q&A. Il fera plaisir de traduire les questions ou les interventions pour nos invités au besoin. Et l'événement de ce soir est aussi enregistré et une version sous-titrée en français sera mise en ligne sous peu. For Dissections, Stan Douglas, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Marissa J. Mormon, Professor of African Cultural Studies at the University of Madison, of Wisconsin-Madison, sorry, and Dr. Candace Sobers, who is Associate Professor of Global and International Studies at Carleton University. In dialogue with the Disco Angola series, our two guests will present their research on the political history and media and sound culture of 1970s Angola. Uh, Disco Angola is a series by Canadian artist Stan Douglas presented at the Phi Foundation until May 22nd, 2022, that's a lot of twos, as part of Revealing Narratives, an exhibition curated by Cheryl Sim. In this series, Douglas takes on the persona of a fictitious photojournalist living in New York City in the 1970s, who is a regular in the emerging disco scene and travels back and forth to Angola to cover the Civil War. The series consists of eight large-scale panoramic photographs, four based in Angola and four in New York, which Douglas arranged into specific pairings. Through intense research into archival photographs, period costumes, and decor, Douglas crafted snapshots from each of these locations, doubly dated 1974 or 5 and 2012. The works in the series cover a critical period for the global political economy, marked by an oil crisis, a global market crash, and increasingly strained relations between the US and the Soviet Union. It is out of this bleak historical context that disco evolved. This important genre, inspired by funk and soul music, became heavily embraced by New York City's Black, Latinx, and queer communities as a joyful expression of emancipation from oppression. Before I introduce our first guest, I would like to thank Phi's founder and director, Phoebe Greenberg, as well as the Phi Foundation's curator and managing director, Cheryl Sim. I would also like to profoundly thank my colleague, Victoria Carrasco, who's an amazing sounding board and accomplice and our fantastic technical Zoom and communications wizard, Dalia Cheng, without whom none of this would be possible. Let me introduce our first guest, Dr. Candice Sobers. Dr. Sobers is an historian of international history and modern international relations, specializing in 20th century decolonization, movements of national liberation, and the global reach of third world revolutionary internationalism, with a specific focus on African independence movements and United States foreign policy. Dr. Sober's research and teaching are informed by questions of race, geopolitics, revolution, and ideas of order and disorder in the international system. Her work crosses geographic, disciplinary, and thematic boundaries, interrogating not only the material and institutional aspects of globalization, but also the circulation and consequences of radical political ideas. This multilingual, multi-sided approach illuminates important aspects of the past and offers insights into the roots of contemporary societal changes. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sobers. Thank you so much, Daniel. So once again, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Daniel for the kind invitation and thank you to the Phi Foundation. 
It's my absolute pleasure to have this opportunity to engage in this conversation with you and with Professor Moriman, inspired by the work of Stan Douglas's 2012 project, Disco Angola. So as a historian, Douglas's work presents a wonderful conundrum. Like most academics, I was immediately thrilled when I saw that someone else was interested in my thing. References to African political African politics and independence movements, particularly in the 1970s, is pretty rare. And so Disco Angola spoke to me immediately. And yet Douglas's work, which is so carefully constructed and composed, is also something that toys with the historical record. And it forces us to re-examine our fealty to archives, to records, and even to memory. So in Disco Angola, as you know, we are drawn into this world of a fictional photojournalist. And I have a pet theory that the 1970s marks the beginning of sort of the heroic documentarian 2.0 as a trope in popular culture. But this heroic documentarian moves between two sort of hyper real spaces, a dynamic disco -esque scene set in New York and a distant othered place. In this case, we are told it is Angola between 1974 and 75. So I am not an arts practitioner or an art historian, but it seems to me that Douglas has done several clever things with this series. The emphasis on juxtaposition. So by invoking iconic imagery of the 1970s and what could be more iconic than disco, Douglas has really encapsulated a vision of the decade, which we often consider to be frivolous, tasteless, individualistic, and self-absorbed. Disco is both evocative and curiously familiar, and as Daniel said in the introduction, as a music style and as an underground cultural movement, disco suddenly went mainstream and faced a public backlash that was more than tinged with classist, racist, homophobic, and transphobic sentiment. But Douglas has also paired this vision with another one and used some other iconic iconography of foreign and other othered places. These images come to us from Southeast Asia, from Latin America, and of course, from the African continent. And these scenes are somewhat less familiar and more disconcerting, though we should always be careful because we do not know who among us has indeed lived through war and displacement. This is a different 1970s. It's the 1970s of social and political unrest, of violence and conflict, oil shocks, radical solidarity movie, movements, terrorism, economic and environmental decline, and geopolitical tensions straining just beneath the surface of Cold War detente between the US and the Soviet Union. When I teach histories of the 20th century or the global Cold War, the 1970s are the one decade that students uniformly dislike. They think of it as the decade that style and sense forgot, one of confusing politics, social dis-ease, and truly unfortunate clothes. And part of the issue, of course, is as others have noted, the 1970s are wedged between the more romantic 1960s and 1980s periods where we feel like there are clear narratives. So by unsettling temporality and enabling disjuncture, Douglas's Dishko Angola takes us to a moment of possibility and peril of the familiar and perhaps the unfamiliar. And as such, I think it's a really perfect visual metaphor for thinking about the seventies and geopolitics. So I use historical methods to interrogate and historicize the development of what we call the 20th century international system and the tenets of international relations theory. So I think a lot about the assumptions that are made about how nation states, their agents and institutions and their challenges and supporters work together. One of my major concerns is how sociopolitical and ideational formations give rise to really very specific notions of order, system, place and power, and how these articulations are inscribed and reified and challenged and reconfigured over time. In a way then, like Douglas, I use the case of Angolan independence to interrogate a series of questions and processes, such as decolonization and independence, national liberation, race, racialization and freedom. 
And just a quick caveat, I will say in this instance, I'm using independence and decolonization pretty much interchangeably, but I do recognize that for many, these are different processes representing different and at times quite contradictory goals. So I tend to focus on African independence and movements in the international system and Angola in particular. And the kinds of connections I look for are between the independence movements and their allies, both within Africa and transnationally, how they got practical aid, but also the sort of affective and emotional connections, what we might call a solidarity practice. And I also look at how their opponents work together to curtail or stop these movements of independence. So in the context of Cold War studies, then, I tend to push back against statements like this. So this is just one uh, statement that comes from quite well-received text on revolutions. It says, for years, Angola was a sleepy Portuguese colony in Africa where nothing ever seemed to change and about which outside powers did not concern themselves. As a result of a revolution that culminated there in 1975, however, Marxist Cuba and white ruled South Africa each sent thousands of troops to Angola, which would be an arena of Soviet American competition for the next 15 years. I tend to focus instead on statements more like this. So this is from Mario Pinto de Entrade, who is one of the early leaders of a movement called the MPLA, which we'll discuss, where he writes, today the people of the third world have become the protagonists in history. They've created a new balance in international relations and have provoked worldwide reactions. The entire world is convinced that any event concerning nations is fundamental for all mankind. Angola, yesterday unknown in international public opinion, a country that few persons can locate on a map, has made its definitive entrance onto the stage of history at a time when armed combat has been initiated in that part of Africa. So Disco Angola, as we know, is set in a very specific moment in time, 1974 to 1975. And I'll return to the significance of that moment in a minute. But first, I'd like to take a step back if I may, to the end of the Second World War. Because what's often overlooked in the triumphal narrative of Western victory over the Axis is the fact that the fatally weakened European empires entered directly into a long series of vicious battles to retain their colonial possessions. There is no Western nation that gave up its traditional adherence to empire and quite explicit white supremacy without fight. We can think of France and Indochina, what is now Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, also Algeria, the also tensions in Senegal and Mali, the Netherlands and Indonesia, the Belgians and the Congo, Indian partition and also the Kenyan revolts, and in Portugal, a series of conflicts in Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, Sao Tome, and of course, Angola. So these struggles against formal empire are the root causes of many familiar 20th century clashes. And many of the most high profile political crises are at least in part the result of a decolonization process gone awry. In very real terms, third world independence is an unprecedented challenge to the international system. If we use UN membership alone as a metric, and it is an imperfect one, the number of states in the international system go from 51 to roughly 117 in only 20 years. There's no one process of independence. In some places, it was peaceful and orderly, and in others, it was achieved only after protracted war and revolution. Some states had stable governments right away, and others are ruled by military juntas or dictators for decades. But in all cases, it's worth remembering that these states emerged into an intensely hostile international system. It's also worth remembering too, that we tend to have an empire to nation state fiction, which is the idea that the imperial powers suddenly saw the light, divested themselves of their colonies and the world transitioned to a series of sovereign nation states. When in reality, empires and nation states coexisted for much of the 20th century. So when Cold War tensions are superimposed over these civil and anti-colonial conflicts, the results are often devastating. Politics were made not only in the super cap power capitals of Moscow and Washington, but also among actors in across the world's national liberation movements and their allies. So the Cold War, of course, is thus mainly only cold in areas that are not consumed by the politics and passions of decolonization. 
transition. And on the slides, you can just see a couple of examples of these sort of third world solidarity movements. I've got Patrice Lumumba from the Congo in the center there. That's Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana over on the left. And these are um, movements from the third world solidarity movements and the um, Nelson Mandela in the 1990s. So Angola proper then, in brief, in April 1974, when a revolution in Lisbon ended 40 years of authoritarian rule and five centuries of Portuguese imperialism, what seemed like overnight, the Angolan War of Independence quickly became an international cause célèbre. Swept up in the momentum of the Cold War with the arrival of radical troops from the South African Defense Force and the Cuban military mission in 1975, The externalization of Angola and independence captured the attention of pundits and policymakers from the US to Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, and from Colombia to Luxembourg. And yet a careful examination of the record suggests that Angolan independence became an international issue long before the very dramatic events of 74-75. And this is in part because the already fraught, intricate, and contentious processes of independence were exacerbated by the fact that in Angola, there are three movements vying for independence. They are roughly, they are roughly equally balanced, but they're also mutually antagonistic and supposedly ideologically um, opposed. And each one of these movements claim to represent a specific element of Angolan society and Angolans as a whole. So I'll show you a slide in a moment, but to break this down, you have the FNLA led from Kinshasa by committed anti-communist central intelligence agency asset, Holden Roberto. This is the first movement and the first favorite of the United States and the People's Republic of China. The MPLA is led by the Marxist Agostino Neto, who received military assistance from the Soviet bloc and later from Cuba. And UNITA is led by Jonas Sinvimbi, and this is contentious, but you can argue that Sinvimbi is best described as ideologically opportunistic. Uh, he does begin as a committed member of the Afro-socialist world. He uses the same language as the FNLA and MPLA in the beginning, but as the decades progress, he becomes a virulent anti-communist. And this is part of why he's supported by the United States and South Africa. So these movements are locked in a destructive three-way battle to dominate the independence struggle, to defeat Portugal and its allies, and to define and control the post-independence Angolan state. By 1974, these movements have already been fighting each other and collecting external support for almost 15 years. So due to the overall arching Cold War competition, these liberation movements made mutually advantageous alliances, sometimes with established great powers, other times with communities of like-minded activists and NGOs, which in turn helped provide the material needed to continue to battle the Portuguese and each other. As for Portugal, as one of the weakest states in Europe, it was the least willing and perhaps least able to relinquish its colonies. It's often referred to as the last empire. By 1974, Portugal was employing over 150,000 troops and committing half of its annual budget to fighting three simultaneous colonial insurrections. The Portuguese military authority also reported over 100,000 draft dodgers, which is a sure sign of the unpopularity of these African wars. So by April 1974, when a left-leaning faction of the Portuguese army launched a coup, this new government ceased all hostilities with the Angolan opposition in May and tried to negotiate an official ceasefire agreements, first with UNITA and then later with the MPLA and FNLA. Angola's independence date was set for November 11th, 1975. And this led to an immediate three-way battle to control the capital of Luanda before the transfer of power. This is an incredibly complex moment. There are rebellions and internal dissent and a series of high profile diplomatic negotiations between settler Angolans, the Organization for African Unity, other related states such as Tanzania and Zambia and Zimbabwe, everyone gets involved. There are several meetings and several negotiations. Uh, documents agreed to, including a tripartite agreement for shared leadership called the Alvor Accords, and it all amounts essentially to nothing. The parties are simply too antagonistic to work together. So here are some FNLA fighters in 1961, and I've been told this is the only image of Neto, Roberto, and Sandy together in, together in Mombasa in 1975. 
So I think that this is the moment then captured or more accurately evoked by Dushko Angola. This is the moment of, of Douglas's fictional photojournalist, this moment of crisis of opportunity and of possibility and peril. So although over 30 different states are involved directly or indirectly, I'm going to just touch briefly on the US and the Cuban roles as these are the ones that I know the best. First to Cuba, under intense pressure from the CIA supported FNLA and South African supported UNITA, the Marxist MPLA placed a desperate call to the Socialist Brotherhood. And that call is answered not by the Soviet Union really, but by Cuba. And it takes them about six months because they're dealing with their own internal issues. And this is really a function of newer scholarship. It had traditionally been assumed that Fidel Castro was in matters of foreign relations, a puppet of the Soviet Union. And we now understand that actually Cuban foreign policy was very independent here. In early October 75, the Cubans launched Operacion Carlota, which is an advanced assault force, and it's named after an African enslaved person who led a rebellion in 1843. This force confronts a combined South African defense force, FNLA army, and a mercenary force on, way to, on route to the capital. And there's a very strong argument that it's only the arrival of these Cuban forces that saved the MPLA. You might ask then why does Castro risk Cuban prestige and credibility, not to mention antagonizing both superpowers on such a risky operation? What can possibly be gained by a show of force 11,000 kilometers away on a continent that barely figures in Cold War calculations? One response is that aspiring to third world leadership is not only a strategic maneuver, it's entirely in keeping with Castro's revolutionary ethos. And in Cold War studies, third world is not the pejorative we tend to use it as, it's actually something that many leaders claimed for themselves. They claimed allegiance to this third world project. So since 59, Cuban rhetoric and policy had reflected a really strong commitment to anti-colonialism and anti-racism. And this message of solidarity was not lost on Angolans. At least one MPLA combatant we know took the nom de guerre of Che Guevara. Cuba also felt a socialist imperative to support the oppressed classes in the spirit of Marxist proletarian internationalism. Prominent African leaders, including Nelson Mandela, would later draw a direct line from the Cuban challenge to the end of apartheid. For apartheid South Africa, these black uprisings that are so communistic in tone are an existential threat. But something a little bit different, I think, is going on in the United States. When these external armies from opposing sides showed up, this aspect of internationalization of the conflict set the stage for the intensification of fighting. And since global prestige and equilibrium were at stake, it was imperative that neither Cold War power be seen to back down over Angola. U.S. officials assumed that the Cuban intervention had been ordered by the Soviet Union, a clever way to get around the policy of detente. In Angola, we find that U.S. foreign policy decision makers were forced to acknowledge something very uncomfortable, that revolutionary nations often had political agendas of their own, which could have significant ramifications on the international system at large. The U.S.'s response to this predicament was a very ill-advised foreign policy covert operation codenamed IA feature. In this, basically, the United States raises its payments to uh, Roberto, and they were encouraged to support, seek support for the FNLA and UNITA by their allies Mobutu and Kenneth Kundo Zaire. Why? because both were vehemently opposed to South African intervention, but they were also extremely concerned about the stabilizing effects of the Soviet intervention. On September 25th, 1975, the details of this covert operation are leaked and simultaneously the money ran out and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, now fearful of ceding territory and influence to Cubans, was forced to go to Congress and ask for an emergency supplemental appropriation of $28 million. Not only was he denied, but it led to two um, amendments which limited their ability to use funds. When I started doing research on this, I would frequently go to conferences and people who did diplomatic history would insist that Angola never ever came up in these high level conversations. But I've got these two documents here and many more. 
And I just think it's really interesting to point out that they having these conversations at the highest levels, right? This is Leonid Brezhnev, general secretary, who is making jokes about, you know, launching attacks on the United States. And Kissinger is saying, of course, from Angola. Later on, Kissinger and the foreign minister and Tolik totally Guriko are having conversations. And I do love this line. You suggested the Middle East, we suggest Angola. We can compromise on discussing peaceful nuclear explosions. For the Nixon and Ford administrations, the fact that African transnational and non-state actors had weakened detente, threatened the Western alliance, undermined strategic bipolarity, curtailed the US's freedom of action, and raised very unsettling questions about American credibility was very hard to bear. The events surrounding Angolan independence suggested that power did not always necessarily equal control, and it opened them up to a lot of very uncomfortable allusions to Vietnam. When the Portuguese flag was lowered from the state building at midnight on the 11th of November, the MPLA had effectively regained control of Luanda. By March of the next year, the war is effectively over and MPLA leader Neto is installed as the first president of the People's Republic of Angola. Soon the uh, OAU would recognize the MPLA government despite extensive lobbying from the US. And almost a year later in December, 1976, Angola became the 146th member state of the UN. Though 28 countries were absent from the vote, only the US formally abstained. So Angola's obsession to, United States, to the General Assembly signifies an end to the War of Independence or the revolution, but not to the conflict between the liberation movements or to the US's animosity. And indeed, we now move on to a period of intense civil war. So these events, Cuban troops on the African mainland, South African troops beyond their own borders, American intelligence offers launching covert operations, are important and fascinating elements. These are the highlight reel of Cold War intrigue. And studies that emphasize these aspects go a long way to addressing some very immense lacunae in the way we think about the Cold War, and especially thinking about where Africa and Africans should be and indeed were. But in these readings, Angola is always, you know, a site that is acted upon by external forces. And Angolans had very little, if any, control over the situation. These are what are often referred to as proxy wars. So in my own research, I argue that rather than think of this as external proxy war, the leaderships of the MPLA, FNLA, and UNITA conceived of Angolan liberation as part of a transnational struggle, first in concert with other Lusophone territories, then in part of a pan-African battle to end minority rule, and finally as part of a global anti-imperialist resistance movement. And we can see evidence of this in the language, rhetoric, and symbols that the, are used by the liberation parties. So in other words, by explicitly framing Angolan independence as part of this wider global battle against imperialism, against racism, against Western hegemony, by the 1960s, raising this issue internationally, creating these transnational support networks, the Angolan National Liberation Movements established the preconditions for the military interventions and the Cold War political theater of the 1970s. So what do I think we can learn from this or why is it interesting? I like to look at things like Holden Roberto and look at the ways that these movements talked about the international situation. They knew what was going on and they explicitly used similar language to get attention to their cause. Right? I particularly enjoy the fact that he referred to um, the frontline states as having their own Mason-Dixon line. To conclude, what can we do with this? We can complicate the Cold War by asking questions about agency and actors. Cold War history and international history are notorious for neglecting the African continent almost in their entirety, though this is now changing. But the unspoken assumption I think remains that world shaping and world making processes and ideas, such as the rise of human rights discourse, battles for social justice or civil equality, convergence and globalization, all emanate from Western sites and African actors are largely absent from these narratives. But I would argue that by agitating for formal independence, Black and Arab African nationalists deliberately challenged an international political order that was characterized by white minority rule and Western hegemony. And as such, they develop, 
they deliver at a really crushing blow to what Robert Vitalis has termed the global norm of white supremacy. So I have just a couple of pictures I'd like to show you here from political cartoons. One of the things to think about is, of course, how much of a role race played in this and how many people used invocations of sort of racial terror as a good reason not to give Angolans independence and a good reason to continue to push back against it. We can also use these questions to think about recentering emancipatory politics. Um, emancipatory movements are so important in the 20th century, and they really shape the contours of how we think about states and nations and liberation and self-determination and sovereignty. Often narratives of empire and independence focus solely on the French and British empires, and they ignore the Portuguese empire and its global connections. So I would argue that we should also think about the rise and mobilization of emancipatory movements that accelerated some geopolitical and social crises, primarily in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. I think it also tells us something about nationalism and revolution, and it opens up a space for thinking about what does it mean to be a nation? Questions of nation and world order are not the exclusive domain of Westerners or academics, but are a real preoccupation of anti-colonial nationalists and attentive publics that supported them. We have to be careful that we don't wholesale believe the narratives that are perpetuated about from the nationalist movements themselves. We can't assume primacy or homogeneity, but I do think that these moments are about more than creating new flags or new anthems. They're about rethinking the global order and acknowledging a multitude of demands for power and participation in an international system that had hitherto legitimized the exclusion of African actors. So I'll just say a few more things if you'll bear with me. These political cartoons come and they really do a very good job of sort of highlighting the racial tension. Right? So this one is invoking the Bandung Conference in 1955 and that's the Afro-Asian People's Conference that led to the creation of the Non-Aligned Movement in 1961. This one I think is pretty obvious, right? The specter of black terror, you can see here that South Africa and Angola are over there, but Mississippi and Georgia are not really far behind. These are, I'll show you two series of Russian and Chinese propaganda. So a lot of Cold War use was made of this. So these are Soviet propaganda posters and I'll follow them by Chinese ones. There are rallies internationally in support of uh, uh, Angolan people. So this is in Algeria, 1963. Of course, Algeria really becomes a hotbed of revolutionary solidarity until 19, 1966. One of the things the MPLA did that's very successful is it made allegiances with other leftist Afro-Marxist parties, such as Frelimo in Mozambique and the African National Congress in South Africa. And what I spend most of my time doing now is actually looking at solidarity movements. So I'm looking at ordinary people, maybe half a world away, who think that they're part of the struggle, who felt so strongly about these movements that they collected money, they tried to go to Angola to document the, the war itself, to see it firsthand. So this is a particular Toronto company that I'll be working on. And you can see we've got documents coming from Norway. This one happens to be in, from a, uh, a meeting that took place in Oslo, down to the Black Panthers having conversations about this in February 1976. And it continues all the way through to the 1980s. So with that, I think I'll stop now, but I'll be happy to answer any other questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Silvers, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I uh, would now like to introduce our second guest, Dr. Marissa J. Mormon. Uh, Dr. Mormon has an, a national and an international reputation as a leader in Angolan studies, Southern African history, and African media studies. She has published two important books with a top university press, numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals that shape African cultural studies, as well as book chapters and other shorter pieces. Her work on music, radio, and urban culture in contemporary Africa and Angola is one that no scholar in modern African history can ignore. Like her first book, Intonations, A Social History of Music and Nation in Luanda, Angola from 1945 to Recent Times. Her second monograph, Powerful Frequencies, Radio, State Power, and the Cold War in Angola, 1933-2002, 
published in the highly regarded series, New African Histories, makes a valuable contribution to the social and political history of Angola in Southern Africa. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marissa Mormon. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah, great, okay. Um, first, let me say, I didn't write that bio. Some of one of my colleagues wrote it. I would not say those things about myself. Um, <laughs> um, I wanna thank Danielle Fizet and the, and the Phi Foundation uh, for the invitation to participate in this really fantastic event. And I wanted to thank Dr. Sobers for sharing this space with me. I'm really honored to be in conversation with her today um, in dissections. So I'm going to begin, she gave us a very macro um, vision of what was happening in Angola in 1974 and 1975 that's really wonderful, and I'm going to give us a very um, micro perspective on what's happening in Angola. And I'm going to start that out by playing some music. <laughs> Okay, I think the music stopped. Um, so that is David Zay's Rumba Zatukine from 1973. Um, it was a hit in the period that, um, that Stan Douglas's work focuses on 1974 to 1975. Um, and I'd like, I can call it sort of one version of what Angola sounded like in 1974 to 1975. Um, as I hope you noticed, this is dance music. This then is the disco in Angola, not the New York City scene across the ocean, but Angola's own thriving music scene. I'm gonna give you another version of what Angola sounded like in 1975, but I need to switch my screen to do that. So um, what you're going to hear and see is Angola's first president, Agustino Neto, declaring Angola's independence in the name of the MPLA, the Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola, in the early hours of November 11th, 1975. <laughs> Correspondendo aos anseios mais sentidos do povo, o MPLA declara o nosso país constituído em República Popular de Angola. Okay, so I wanna uh, draw your attention to a couple of things there. So Agustino Neto proclaims in the name of the Central Committee of the MPLA, the independence of Angola, and then goes on to announce that um, at this moment, the country has been constituted as the popular Republic of Angola, underscoring many of the, um, the points about sort of um, international socialism and international revolutionary movements that Dr. Sobers has made. Um, you may have also noticed um, over in the right-hand corner, there was a man in a blue jumpsuit who was a foreign journalist, which I think is significant for our conversation about um, Stan Douglas's work, Disco Angola. And then I also um, 
had us watch to a point where we could see a few of the people in the audience moving around and you could see their bell bottoms swaying, um, pointing to some of the uh, kind of international forms of fashion that were popular in Angola at the time. Um, otherwise, this form of sound, this clip we've just seen, um, shows an Angola entangled with the Cold War. That is, and Angola in the dance, if not the disco, that is international geopolitics. Not just Cold War spheres of influence and alignments, but global, global economic crises and decolonizing countries attempting sovereignty and non-alignment. I, I use these sounds to launch my comments today because the work by Stan Douglas, Disco Angola, and your general knowledge about the country might give you the impression that Angola sounded like the rat -tat of machine guns and the stridency of emboldened and embattled ideologies. It was also that, but prior to the civil war that broke out at independence was the anti-colonial war, the liberation struggle from 1961 to 1974. <clears throat> and that's, that period sounded quite different. The liberation movements located, located in exile in neighboring countries fought the Portuguese military, mostly along the borders and in the isolated regions of the Mayombe forest in Angola's north and in the Dembos in the country's interior. Inside the Angolan territory in those years, life was not, for the most part, war-torn. In fact, it was a period of unprecedented economic and cultural growth. Culture thrived, especially in the capital, Luanda, where a busy music scene and nascent music industry brought people together and made them dance. All of this was by Angolans for Angolans. Oops. So a few words about Stan Douglas's Disco Angola. I encountered Stan Douglas's work in the pages of the New Yorker magazine as an announcement of the opening at the David Werner Gallery in 2012. My first response was a sense of the familiar strange. In fact, it's a sensation I just can't shake. In preparation for our conversation today, I've spent time looking closely at the images on my two small laptop screen, expanded them on my, uh, on my two rarely used large screen display in my office, explored the mock-ups of the exhibit at the Phi Foundation and read announcements and analyses of the work. Contemporary art critics, art historians, and even scholars of dance focus on how the display of photographs of reenacted, historically researched, and reimagined bygone moments, disco in New York and civil war in Angola, brings disparate places into provocative alignment. Put simply, you think these places, so far one from the other, will have nothing to do with one another. But look again, think again. Douglas's Disco Angola asks viewers to consider 1974-1975, a pivotal moment when Angola's independence in November of 75 also inaugurated civil war and when commercial imperatives began to invade the New York underground disco scene, stifling its liberatory impulses. This all rings true. As a trained historian, I see in disco Angola visual art as history. Of course, it's also much more than that. Like Douglas, historians ask questions of the past and of their sources. We work along the jagged edges of fragments, the emptiness created by disappearances and silencing, and along and against the grain of documents and sources from the past to render narrative sense. Douglas uses recreated scenes in photographic stills and spatial display to create visual enjambment, connection across a line break or a border. The result is a resonance in the images, their suspension in time, and the viewer's sense that they are being plunked down in media race. So I want to return now to the idea of familiar strange. When I saw some of the photographs of Disco Angola in The New Yorker, I saw images of an Angola that I both recognized and that also struck me as slightly off. Both of those elements caused estrangement. Douglas deploys a fictitious photojournalist who transits the distinct spaces of New York City's disco underground and Angola's transition to independence and civil war. Douglas asks us to question the concept of documentary. We can see the photographs are carefully crafted. Each mise-en-scene intentionally composed, each actor model placed just so, each movement frozen. The estrangement I experienced came from the construction of the scene. 
it was clearly not Angola, Angola, excuse me, but also it was. And in fact, a good friend of mine insists that this photograph was taken in his neighborhood. Um, and the, the scene of Portuguese settlers getting ready to depart is straight from uh, Polish journalist Ryszard Kopaczynski's book, Another Day of Life. Um, the other element that caused estrangement for me though, was a sense of a false distinction. These worlds in fact um, seem too different. What do I mean? The New York underground disco is different from the war, even if it also represents a political battle, but it resonates with life in Angola's capital, Luanda in particular, in the early 1970s. The world associated with the first song that I played, the world in which Angola's liberation movements were fighting the anti-colonial war. The photo that catches a glimpse of that world is the one you see before you now, a luta continua where a woman resplendent in an almost garish green outfit of bell bottoms and platform shoes stands in front of a wall painted in the colors of the MPLA flag. Such paintings were one way that the liberation movements turned political parties claimed urban space in Luanda in the transition between the military coup of April 25th in Portugal and the MPLA's declaration of independence for Angola on November 11th, 1975. So let me say something uh, more about music. I conducted research um, on my book project on Angola, in Angola between about 1997 and 2002. And I learned from musicians that, that, that the music called Semba was music that emerged between 1961 when the anti-colonial war broke out and 1974 when the Portuguese began to leave. That music embodied, Angolans told me, Angolanidad or Angolanus the sense of being Angolan. Yet Angolan musicians refer to the period around independence as the hiatus in Angolan music, something they really date to really the period 1974, 1975 and extending until about 1990. I initially found this confusing. Why? Because musicians claimed that the very music that identified the Angolan nation stopped at the moment of independence. That is an overstatement, of course, but as I came to understand, these musicians were trying to make a point. And that point was that even though they were not guerrilla soldiers in the liberation movements, they had helped to realize independence. Cultural processes and namely the music scene and the production of music and its circulation as records or discs and on radio anticipated and cultivated the ground for political change. So much so that many musicians began working in favor of the MPLA before the liberation movement, um, or any of the liberation movements, in fact, officially returned to Luanda in 1975. Many musicians from the Luanda scene rolled up their sleeves and got to work building the new nation, which in the context of a Cold War inflamed civil war meant ideological work and practical labors too. They used music to support the new state. They also served in neighborhood commissions and other forms of self-organization across the transition period between 1974 and 1975. So now I'm gonna go back in time a little bit more um, to see what the world of Luanda was like between the mid 1960s and the early 1970s when the music known as Semba really uh, took on great force. <clears throat> 1961 was the beginning of the anti-colonial war it also signaled a change in colonial policy as the Portuguese administration engaged a two-pronged strategy of political repression and economic and social reform. That created some real changes in people's day-to-day -day lives. The abolition of segregation laws allowed Black Angolans greater access to education, even if urban space remained divided. And what you see here is a map of Luanda, um, the, these are the areas, these are the asphalted streets, and these areas here are what are known as the museks, which were informal neighborhoods, informal in the sense that they don't have the kind of infrastructure that the central part of the city has. <clears throat> An opening to foreign investment after 1961 sparked the economy. Suddenly, young men who lived in the museks, informal neighborhoods on the urban periphery, could find work and generate disposable income. Skilled artisans um, opened their own businesses, tailors and seamstresses, mechanics, barbers, and watch repairmen were all common. 
some Lusak residents opened member-based recreational clubs, like you see here in this photograph, which hosted parties, offered classes, and founded football teams. 58 such clubs emerged between 1961 and 1971, and the colonial state sponsored a street music festival called Kutunaka that made the music played in private clubs available to the masses, as did the radio and the, um, the, the nascent music industry. So I've been talking too much, so let me play another piece of music for you. Oops. So that was Miluro by the Kiezush, which is a Kimbundu word that means brooms. Um, they got that name because they were good. <laughs> they made people dance so much that it raised the dust in, um, in the clubs and in the backyard parties where they played. The song Miluro is both typical of music of, of the period and a bit unusual or maybe um, just edgy. The name Miluro takes the Portuguese verb melhorar to improve and reinterprets it in Kimbundu, the language spoken in and around Luanda. You see the lyrics, um, you can see the lyrics here. The refrain in this case is sung in Portuguese and in English it translates as go, get out of here. Most, most musical lyrics were never this explicit. A fascist dictatorship ruled Portugal and the secret police actively pursued dissidents and anything they found politically suspicious in Portugal and in the colonial territories. Once when the band performed this song in the early 1970s, the secret police detained the lead singer, Vata Costa. Interrogated about the song, he explained that the song was not about the Portuguese, but about another band, Cabinda Ritmush, from the country's north that they had arrived in Luanda and they were stealing the Chiesa's girlfriends and gigs. This was a pretty credible story, <clears throat> but listeners also understood it as a critique of, the, of Portuguese colonialism. And it was a very specific one, one that insulted those who did not want to dance or create real change. Most music was less explicit and represented the trials of everyday life. Jobs lost, friends disappeared, hearts broken. A lot of music talked about women and a little music was played by them. Of course, it wasn't just the lyrics that mattered. I point to sounds, signs, and sentiments that made the music scene significant. First, sounds. Singing in Kimbundu, the combining of Angolan instruments with Western ones, adopting Congolese guitar styles, and using the Dikanza. Signs included new ways of dressing bell bottoms and African prints, head wraps folded just so, African and black hairstyles, fashion and musical inspirations from James Bound to Charles Aznavour to Roberto Carlos, but never from Portuguese musicians. And finally, sentiments. As one musician told me, we all felt Angolan with the music. So let me go back to the question of the hiatus in Angolan music. These album covers um, will visualize the change in the signs that occurred across 1974 and 1975. So on the left here, we see David Zay, who we saw, uh, who we heard a piece of music by him at the beginning. You can see the bell bottoms. Um, he's looking, it's like a very 70s look. Um, and here on the right, Santoka, similarly. Both of these albums came out right around 1974, 1975 um, on the Rebita label, which was an Angolan um, 
produced record label. Rebita is a word um, that refers to a form of dance and music from the late 19th, Angolan form of dance and music from the late 19th century. So these were these came out right around 1973, 1974, 1975. These images of album covers from the same musicians uh, both came out in 1975. Again, on the left, David Zay, um, dressed as a soldier, as a guerrilla fighter. Um, and on the right, the image of Santokas's album, which I actually also have here, um, produced by the MPLA's Department of Information and Propaganda. So let me just play a little of the sound for you. Antagonista ao novo regime governamental. Então, cuidado se você é branco, preto ou mulato. Não pense nisso e vamos construir. Se é reacionário, pense bem em ter uma atitude anti-povo. Mas quem é que manda? Eu, povo. E quem é o povo? Eu é Pela. Ai, mas quem é que manda? Eu, povo. E quem é o povo? Eu é Pela. That was um, a different sound then that they started to produce in 1975. Um, when artists began to put their music skills to work for the MPLA. Um, Perhaps you couldn't notice that, but that was music sung not in Kumbundu, but sung in Portuguese, um, in music that embodied the ideology of the MPLA, saying that um, the MPLA is the people and the people are the MPLA. Um, who is in charge? The people are in charge. Who are the people? The people are the MPLA. Um, that was that music um, that we just heard was played by uh, a group called Agrupamento Kisangela, and it was formed in 1975 and accompanied President Neto on his visits to cities and towns across Angola as well as overseas. Music helped establish helped the MPLA establish itself throughout the country. Indeed, when Neto first returned to Angola in early 1975, he traveled the country with three of the best known musicians, Urbano de Castro, Artur Nunes, and Carlos Lamartin. While Angolans would have known the name and maybe the face of the MPL leader, Agostino Neto, colonial censorship had been intense and there was very little communication between the political liberation movements and people living inside the territory. <clears throat> People inside Angola would have been much more familiar with the music, the style, and the sounds of the musicians. But pretty quickly, um, as the song Avante Poder Popular demonstrates, music was taken over by political forces. The MPLA and the FNLA and UNITA had been fighting from exile for 14 years. When they returned to Angola, they returned to a country and to a capital they did not recognize. While musicians were key to organizing the capital in favor of the MPLA, the music scene itself, cosmopolitan and urbane, yet resonant with the sounds and stories of rural Angola, shut down before being put to the purposes of nation building. One man, Armand Cure da Zvedu, who had emceed excuse me, the street festival's Kutunaka, described it this way, quote, I was hosting the show in Sambizanga in the Mario Santiago soccer field. By the middle of the show, the place was totally full. I gave the microphone as a sign that the Kutunokas were over, at least for me. I gave the microphone to a member of the Central Committee of the MPLA, who then turned the Kutunoka into a political rally. And that was the end of Kutunoka. So I think this, um, uh, this quote that somebody said to me in an interview is really interesting because he really it uses it to say that um, what, 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 what had been this massive street festival uh, hugely popular in the late colonial period in the late 1960s and early 1970s was literally taken over um, at the microphone by the central committee of the MPLA. And that marked the moment of the end of that street festival and the beginning of a new kind of musical moment um, in the country. So, um, that period, um, what, Ang what Angola musicians often refer to as the hiatus really continued up um, until 1990. So thinking again about the woman in Stan Douglas's photo, Aluta Continua, 
a woman encountered serendipitously by Douglas's fictitious photojournalist, reminds me of the music scene that helped pave the way for Angolan nationalism by creating the Angolan nation and shaping expectations about independence. The color contrast between her and the flag, as well as her pose, show us that those expectations overlapped, though imperfectly, they did not precisely align. She also recalls for me a moment in Mauritanian filmmaker Abderamani Sisako's film, Rostov Luanda, another work that blurs the border between documentary and fiction and teaches profound historical truths. In search of an old friend from film school who he, whom he met in the Soviet city of Rostov, where they were both studying, Sisako interviews many people across the Angolan territory. Dressed in fatigues and sitting at home, a female soldier says that she got involved in the MPLA and joined um, the military because as a late teen in 1975, she trotted off to a political rally following her friends. Sometimes affective questions, social and cultural connections lead to politics. That's the story of music in late colonial Angola. Stan Douglas himself often works with film and moving images. Writer Rachel, writer Rachel Kushner notes that Douglas worked on these images in Disco Angola like he would work on a film, employing cast and crew, attending to lighting, props, blocking, and costumes as on a set. What these photos demand then is also the willing suspension of disbelief, a practice otherwise associated with film viewing. Disbelief in the fact that Luanda and New York City are more alike than different. Disbelief that Angolans and Africans and Africa in general are coeval with the United States and Europe. I hope that my short talk today has given you reason to believe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mormon, for a fantastic presentation. Apologies for all the technical troubles. <laughs> no technical troubles on my end, at least. It was very smooth. <laughs> I'll invite uh, Dr. Sobers to join us for the Q&A. All right, I see uh, everyone is here. I'll encourage everyone that's uh, joining us via Zoom if uh, they have any questions for our panelists to send them our way via the Q&A uh, section and to do not hesitate to send them either in English or in French. Donc les questions sont les bienvenues dans les deux langues. Il me fera plaisir de les traduire évidemment pour nos invités. Um, but since this is the first uh, occasion uh, on which you are both together on a panel, I wanted to start this Q&A section by inviting you both to respond to each other's presentation. And maybe I'm wondering if there's anything about your specific research that resonates, uh, yeah, the, the, with the both of you. Well, I suppose I can start. I am a big fan of Dr. Mormon's work because my work is so macro level. You know, it really is about elites and the conversations they have amongst each other, African elites and non African elites. And what I really like so much about your work is it humanizes Angolans, it makes Angolans real people, not simply Cold War pawns, which is a very sort of common way of thinking about what happened. I guess my question is more about how the music helped with the nation building, because a comment I frequently get since it's worth pointing out here too, that these parties still exist and Angolan politics is still quite fraught. And so, you know, there are people out there who lived through these liberation wars. There are people who are still members of UNITA and PLA, and this is a real viable concern. These are people's livelihoods. So sometimes I'm at talks and they talk about sort of the development of the MPLA as an international force. And someone will come up to me and say, well, the thing is that Angola isn't really a nation, right? It's a state, it's not a nation because there are too many different groups and too many different parties. And I am just wondering if your research, when you said that the musicians sort of joined up and considered themselves part of creating this new, new nation, if your research if you've ever encountered these sorts of moments and then sort of what do your musicians, what do your Angolans say to these questions? I hope that was clear. <laughs> yes, totally. Um, 
And that's that's a great question. And it's sort of at the center of why I wrote the book or for, that started out as my dissertation re research, because, of course, in the mid and late 1990s, the only things written about um, independence and nationalism in Angola had to do with political movements. Um, and so I was both interested in what those political movements were doing, but being able also able to look at the agency of regular folks in day to day life. Um, and so in conversation with people in Luanda, I learned that, you know, music was, and I was interested sort of in the relationship between cultural practices um, and nationalism. And people began to point me to music and people, it was really in conversation with people that I learned that music was this really important cultural form in that period and time, precisely because it, um, it brought people together. Um, and in fact, the same man, Armando Cure da Azevedo, who's, who talked to me about the kind of transfer of, um, cultural to political power with the ending of the Kutunakas and the, the advent of the MPLA in Luanda also said to me, you know, the, the politicians brought the contradictions. He said, we were all um, in listening to the music, dancing to the music. We were all, we all felt like we were Angolan and, and the politicians showed up later and brought the contradictions, which I always thought was a really interesting <laughs> way, um, shorthand way of describing what happened. Um, and it's interesting over time, I, um, I've also written about radio and in talking to people, um, you know, fairly prominent members of UNITA, they also all remember listening to some of whom were in exile in this period, in the late um, 1960s and early, particularly in the early 1970s. Um, and um, Sosa Jamba, who's a, a, an important figure in UNITA and a journalist and, and writer in his own right, said to me, you know, he knows all these songs by heart. The music from this period and he listened to it on the radio in Zambia. Um, so I think that's a really powerful thing as well. And Unita actually had its own musical groups um, right around independence as well, um, most of them based in, in Wambo and in central Angola. So, um, so I guess I could ask um, a question. I'm really fascinated by your work and, um, and also by your new work. And I'll just share this little um, liberation support movement album, little, not, it's not little, it's big, <laughs> um, which I think is a great connection between um, the sort of work that you're doing and what I'm doing. Um, so I'm interested in actually just knowing how you got, how you came to do this work. Why Angola? And I, I also absolutely shared your um, same sort of response to Stan Douglas's work, which is like, oh my God, somebody else is interested in this. Yay. <laughs> Nobody talks about Angola. So the short version of that is I was doing, it's actually not that short. So I had gone to the London School of Economics to do my master's degree. And bizarrely, I was going to go do Canadian foreign policy. I've always been excited by the Cold War. Who knows why I thought I just really wanted to go to London to school, quite frankly. Uh, and in the olden days, when you, you signed up for your classes, we literally physically went to the room to sign up. And when I went there, the room was locked because the prof was on sabbatical. So the next class over said third world revolutions. And I thought, oh. honestly, the rest of the classes, you've got to cross London to go sign up for it. I guess I'm signing up for that one. And that course, actually changed my life because I learned something important that I had graduated, you know, done pretty well, knew that I was going to be a Cold War historian, was excited about the possibility of going to do a PhD later on, thought that I was getting a really good handle on this very complex moment of history, and did not know a single thing about the African continent. Zero. And thought, how is it possible actually? How is it possible that there is so much that goes on? And in fact, these challenges that these smaller countries can be system destabilizing of this, I just couldn't believe that I had no idea. And so it wasn't until that class that I learned about all of this turmoil and how many groups were fighting with each other. And I just became really fascinated by Angola specifically, just that tension between the movements the efforts they have to go through to differentiate themselves from each other. And if you think about it, you know, it, typically there's one, maybe two movements, but now there's three. And so they've got to spend a lot of time saying, no, 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 we are the representative of the Angolan people. And let me tell you why. And watching that evolution was fascinating. And then just learning that people like Henry Kissinger 
we're suddenly thinking, oh, now I've got to figure out where this place is on a map, you know, and have to answer these questions. I found that incredibly compelling. And I've been interested in it ever since. So. You have such a rich archive of materials that you shared with us. It's just such a great, um, you know, like it just shows us the print record, like in the international press and other places, aside from the, the diplomatic materials, it's just mm -hmm. fascinating. And I love oh. your insistence that it's not a proxy war. I'm always editing that out of people's. Thank you, me too. <laughs> <laughs> we are aligned on that. Yeah, that is a term I absolutely hate. I mean, not only is it not useful in this context, because who's the proxy war between? Is it between the Cubans and the United States? But it's such a it's such a term that removes agency from everywhere else. This is though it's happening to somewhere else. You know, proxy is out there somewhere. And it's all these are real conflicts. These are real people's lives. And Golans are living and dying and fighting for this. Sometimes whether they want to or not. And so it's just really important for me to acknowledge that I'm not telling someone else's story. I'm telling a bigger story. <laughs> Um, but that agency is really important here. I love your work on expressive culture, things like that. You know, as a diplomatic historian by training, songs, later poetry and things like that, uh, this is very suspicious. And so I'm very, very excited by this new archive for me right, that is emerging, um, looking at poetry and looking at pamphlets and visual culture and things like that. I'm, I'd like to maybe... Uh, jump on that notion because I, I, I was very interested in both of your presentations in the presence of material or visual culture. Um, and there are approaches that are more and more getting more and more popularity in academia, but have struggled to take shape in the previous decades, let's say. And I, I wonder if in the case of international relations or African cultural studies, to which extent was material culture a part of the methodologies that were uh, put into place when you first started, let's say, in, in the discipline? And do you notice an evolution in the ways in which people integrate non-textual, or I'm not sure how to describe them, the non-textual, uh, yeah, material? So I, I can... Um... Maybe start. So when I I was in grad school in the in the I started grad school in 1994, um, and people you know people definitely talked about material culture. And I, I'm trained as an historian. My PhD is in African history, and um, of course archaeologists use material culture. But his and historians um, and particularly historians of Africa always use a great I think diversity of different sources. Um, but for me, for the kinds of things I was working on. Um, it was very hard and I didn't actually decide to work on music in particular until I actually got to Angola because I just, there was nothing, nothing, there was no trace of that in the United States. We were, you know, the web was totally new. It didn't, you know, there was nothing online. Um, and in fact, you know, like these sorts of things, you know, actual <laughs> discs were hard to find. They don't last, you know, vinyl does not survive a tropical climate very well. Um, much of the music that I talk about in the book um, was not available to me. I couldn't even hear it. Um, it only started to be reissued in the early 2000s. Today, of course, you can find it all over the place. Um, you know, there, there's lots of music on YouTube. There have been lots of reissues and re-edits, but that's all really happened since the early 2000s. Um, I did spend a long time um, working, not a long time. I spent a couple of weeks working in the national radio station, looking at their collection of music albums. And that to me was really fascinating because I, I would pull the vinyl out. David Zay, three of the musicians um, that I mentioned today, David Zay, Urbano de Castro, and Arthur Nunes, were all murdered in an attempted coup in 1977. Um, and so I, their discs were not in the regular collection at the national radio station because their music couldn't be played for at least a decade um, or longer. Um, but other discs I would pick up and pull out the vinyl and I would see things written all over them. Um, certain songs would be scratched out not, not scratches from use, but literal scratches so that somebody wouldn't play them. Um, so I came to see those as really important kinds of, of sources for me, um, not to mention, you know, the, the album covers themselves and things like that. So I've spoken too much. <laughs> I'll pass the baton. So I have a similar story. You know, when I started, and especially diplomatic archives, there are a lot of pieces of paper. It's very, very textual based. And I didn't really know that I could have access to 
any other archives until I went to Lisbon. And there I was sort of talking to people and I had been to the Imperial Archives, sort of formal archives, Torre de Tombos, things like that. And uh, I was told about sort of smaller collections um, held by people who had been involved in the liberation movement. Something like that. And that's where I found, it's still textual, but for me, visual culture. So I found a lot of pamphlets and posters. I found my absolute favorite document of all time is a literacy manual. It's an MPLA literacy manual and it's published um, in Denmark. So we're gonna get our connections right there and sent back. And it starts with things like, you know, A is for Angola, our country. But by the time you get to X, it says X is like imperialism. Imperialism is the face that lies. And it's just, it's this wonderful document of propaganda and inculcation. And it's not until I got to those archives that I realized you could tell more of the story. I mean, even from the outside, you could get access into, you know, to worlds and to, to feelings and sentiments that are not going to be available in the diplomatic archive, things like that. So now I spend a lot of time sort of tracking down people who have their own small archives, you know, and people who are in the struggle, people who are, you know, university students when this was going on, they've got their memories, they have their pamphlets, they've got the shirts they wore and things like that. So I'm able to incorporate a lot more of that into my current projects. I, I'm also interested in both of your presentations is this in there, there's a tension between a certain kind of visibility of, an, of a history and also a certain kind of invisibility of Angola's history within uh, for Dr. Sober's maybe the larger uh, Cold War studies or the history of the late 20th century. Um, and then Dr. Mormon, you're speaking more directly about kind of a, um, a gap in, in the, because of the of, uh, lack of circulation of music from the 70s up to maybe the early 2000s. I'm curious about that re-emergence of Angolan music in the early 2000s. Are you, you're able to mark it very precisely in history. Are you able to kind of explain why this came about? Is this just a phenomenon of internet making uh, available archives, which would otherwise be very local, or was there was it encouraged by a desire to seek uh, kind of underrepresented or underheard uh, musical cultures in that period? So um, I would say, um, well, briefly, it's got to, to do um, with the end of the war, the Civil War in 2002. So the Civil War that starts in 1975, or arguably 1974, ends in 2002. Um, and that, you know, creates a big change. And there's an oil boom um, until about 2014. Um, so that has a huge impact on the fact, um, as well as the kind of changes in, in um, media forms that make um, make music more more fungible and more more mobile um so i think that's really those are the kind of like key forces operating as well as then a sort of loosening politically which allows people to look at look back to musicians and forms of music that were uh, eclipsed after independence and and would you say that that re-emergence is accompanied by a, a sort of a critical re-examination of of angolan music or has it been more the case of, of kind of an academic interest in, in, in that material? I'm kind of curious in the recirculation of that music post, I guess, 2000s. Yeah, no, it's very, uh, you know, it's a white, it's widely discussed. Um, and, you know, there, and obviously, I mean, Angola has its own um, academics and music journalists um, who are thinking about this. Um, and uh, so it's been a and it's been a hot topic because there's and also the fact the idea that semba, which is this the genre of music um, that I look at, the idea that semba is somehow symbolic of Angolanness has now is now being deeply questioned um, because people say it's not representative um, and it wasn't representative. It was only urban elites. Um, I think that's it's. I think that's um, that's an overstatement, but I, I am sympathetic to to the argument for sure. But I would say it's been a it's been a quite kind of society wide or at least you know sort of um, urban based kind of conversation. And maybe related to that, in, in, in another kind of uh, 
reflection on visibility versus invisibility of, of, of the Angolan conflict. Dr. Sobers, I love the last image of your presentation, which was, I, I think, a, a pamphlet produced in Toronto or, or some kind of a literacy material. I'm not really sure. You'll have to refresh my memory when you answer the question on what it is. And I know, I think this is what you're working on for your next book or project. I'm curious to know, first of all, how uh, much information about the Angolan conflict circulated in Canada around the mid 1970s, uh, either kind of in mass media or maybe in countercultural uh, spaces. And uh, are you able to find archival material related to that? Uh, yeah. So I'm actually just beginning to learn about that in the Canadian context because my earlier work looked a lot at the United States because I also did work on Black nationalism and the civil rights movement. So there are sort of natural affinity connections there. And then also the UK, and then I'm starting to look at France and then the pandemic came and ended that. So, you know, LAC is just the street down the street from me, Library and Archives Canada. And so I will be heading there when, you know, May ends really to start research again on the Canadian connection. But there's a couple of things that are going on. One is that Trudeau Sr., of course, has fairly good relations with Fidel Castro. Right. And so this is a point of constant consternation. The fact that Canada maintains relations with Cuba while the United States does not, this comes up. There's an infamous three day trip where Trudeau and Castro hang out for lack of a better term. And so it is circulating in these diplomatic conversations because there is a lot at stake. You're really balancing being part of the NATO alliance, being part of this construct, the West, excuse the air quotation marks, but there's no other way to convey it. Right? What does this construct mean right now? But how do you balance it with these very strong claims for independence, for anti-racialism and for anti-colonialism? When you have situations where a lot of the leaders and the Department of Foreign Affairs, for example, think that if you are going to argue for black independence, you are arguing for communism. It actually puts the political elite in a very difficult position. It's, it's very straightforward for us now to say, well, absolutely, you should be supporting Black independence and how dare you support South Africa. But they really didn't feel that way at the time. You know, communism is an existential threat. So there is that. What I have learned through this process of the archives is just how many smaller scale um, affective or solidarity communities and networks there were. And I'm still working that. So the Toronto, the liberation support movement is actually prominent enough that it shows up in the Portuguese archives as a point of irritation and annoyance. You can see the Portuguese government states, who do these people think they are all the way over in Toronto? They don't know anything about what's going on here. One of my very first conferences, I went and I gave a paper. It was mostly about Cuba and I saw someone scribbling furiously. Uh oh. That seems bad. And so I, I sort of sidled up to that colleague afterwards and said, oh, I see you looking at my paper. And this colleague said, yeah, your analysis is all wrong. That's not what happened. I thought, oh dear, you know, it's the panic of every historian. Have I read the sources wrong? Did I miss something really important? And the colleague says, well, you got it wrong. I know, because I was there, I was in the struggle. And I said, oh my gosh, you were in Angola? And they said, no, I was in Bologna, but I was in the struggle. So that kind of sense that people still think of themselves as being in struggle and still have very strong opinions of it, I've found quite a lot of traces of that in Canada, and particularly amongst Canadian academics, including some of my colleagues at Carleton. So I'm really looking forward to tracing those threads and those circulations in the months to come. I'm excited to read that research. Uh, I see that time is flying right by us, but I I think we do have time for one last question. I think our audience is being a little shy and quiet. So maybe I'll push with one last question before we leave. Um, I'm curious, and it's a question for the both of you. Uh, I wonder if there is any emerging research or scholarship around Angola that is particularly exciting to you right now. If you'd like to give a little shout out to a fellow colleague who's doing work that you deem interesting in regards to the subject we've we've touched upon tonight. Sure, I'll go. Um, Justin Pierce does really good work on Angolans 
and their political inclinations. And he's done a lot of work on sort of demystifying or maybe de-romanticizing the, the movement's claims to represent specific ethnicities. Right? So they sort of parceled out specific ethnicities and said, we represent you as well as the Angolan people. And uh, Pierce's work shows that there's a lot more fluidity in that, that we, we can't really believe the, the propagandistic stories that came out afterwards. So that, and then Natalia Tiltneva does a lot of very good work on the Soviet bloc and on Eastern Europe. So fantastic language skills. So if you want to know what East Germany and the Soviet Union are doing in those diplomatic conversations, that's the work that I find really exciting. So I would say that um, there's been a lot of new work since Angola opened up after 2002, since the end of the Civil War, um, and in particular on um, urban life and urban history. And I would point to the work of um, Antonio Tomas, who's an Angolan anthropologist based um, in South Africa at the University of Johannesburg. Um, and he, he's done really fantastic work on Luanda. His book is just out or just about to come out um, that looks at it um, both historically and to explain uh, sort of contemporary politics. Um, and there's also really excellent work by Claudia Gastro, who's um, a South African um, anthropologist. Justin Pierce is also South African. So it's interesting that there are lots of people from the region interested in Angola. Um, Claudia works on um, citizenship and urban space. Um, and then another um, Angolan academic also based in South Africa, Sylvia Cruese, who, who also works on um, housing and urban urban space movements. So a shout out to all of them. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks for sharing. It's just that I see the pile of books next to me adding, like growing the more and more I hear that you recommend uh, all of these uh, readings and researches. Um, well, on that note, I would like to thank the both of you for, for joining us tonight for this event and thank you for your wonderful presentations. Uh, and thanks to everyone who, uh, uh, who joined us uh, for these presentations. The uh, video will be available on our archives if ever you wanna revisit the conversation. Uh, and I encourage you to come and visit uh, Revealing Narratives, the Stan Douglas exhibition that is presented at the Phi Foundation in Montreal until May 22nd, 2022. Again, that's a lot of twos. Um, and uh, come and visit us. You have still 10 more days to come and see this exhibition. Uh, on behalf of everyone at the foundation, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening and take care. <laughs>